Okay, so I'm going to paint a little picture for you. Let's say it's、uh, about 10:42 in the evening, or how about sometime between the hours of 10:42 and 1:56 in the morning. You're just about to settle in for the night. You've turned off all the lights. Maybe it's just you're having just a little quiet moment, or or you've already、uh, gone to bed. Dead quiet in the house. You know, this is the country. We're out in, we're out in the rural area here. And then you hear. Oh bloody hell! It's a mouse. In this episode of Straight Outta Gabriola, we're calling Mouse, etc. We're going to talk to about five or five or seven islanders and get their experiences and accounts of dealing with critters. Here's Islander Donnie Groot. I thought when I moved to Gabriola, we would. I I knew with all the water around the island, there'd be be rodents, but I didn't realize that we'd be. Quite as afflicted as we are. Yep, you know we we may not be the tough streets of New York or London or or Amsterdam or or Paris even, where I've seen rats literally run across your feet when you're walking in a park at night.、Um, but because we have、uh, mostly crawl space foundations set in a forested, slightly agricultural rural landscape with、uh, chickens, kinds of pets. You know what? It's it's kind of rodent Shangri La here, and you know this is going to be no fluff piece. This is a、uh, this is serious, hard hitting journalism here, and、uh, and you know so don't expect that you know kind of whimsical background music that you sometimes hear on podcasts or YouTube videos to make it light and funny. This is hard stuff, and and you know what? L- let me see if I can find a I can find just the right theme music to kick this thing off. Let's see what we got here. Yeah, yeah, that'll do. Okay, yeah, we need something. We need something to set the tone. All right, here we go. For the record, can you、uh, state your name? Hello, I'm Marco Fedorik. And your star sign? My star sign. I'm a Gemini. Tell us your favorite mouse story. You've got a few. Oh, my favorite one is when we lived up near the Legends in、mm-hmm. that rented cabin, which I think you probably remember.、Mm-hmm. That five acres.、Uh, it was this log cabin that was moved from like the Okanagan or something. So there was giant holes everywhere in this. Cabin, and we used to try to stuff it with like SOS pads, and we did everything we could to keep them out, but it didn't matter. They were getting in, and at night they were in the walls, and I could hear them fighting, like Tom and Jerry. Like felt like they were having fist fights and yelling at each other. It was like I dropped my earplugs,、mm-hmm. and I would hear. <laughs> I think they would come and like chew on my earplugs under the bed, and it's like we were just—it was horrible. But I remember one time thinking, "Okay, I'm going to bake bread," and I and you know I used to bake bread maybe、mm-hmm. every two or three days for the family. I'd make this beautiful fresh bread, and I said, "Damn you, mice! Damn you! You're not going to get this bread." So I thought, "Well, I'm going to outsmart them. I'm going to bake it fresh and then hide it in the oven, right?" I、mm-hmm. figured, well. How could they get in the oven? Like it yeah, did like not. Like a safe. Yeah, I figure、yeah. there's no way because I used to put it in the middle of the table, and and we had a cat, but they still would get in in the middle of the table. Anyway, so the next morning I woke up, I was all happy to make Chloe her breakfast, you know, with a piece of bread, some French toast, and like there sitting in the middle of the loaf was this mouse inside the stove. Inside the stove. On top of the loaf, and it was like he's sitting there, and it's like he's waving at me and like chewing on it and going, "Oh, thanks, thanks for making me this giant loaf of bread." Anyway, I was like so mad. That was just one story from that place, but I think I remember too how bad it was. I buy those big flats of peaches,、mm-hmm. right? 
you know, and there'd be like 12 in a cardboard box or something, mm-hmm. and it's open, and I just go, well, I'm not going to put it on the floor. You don't put it in the fridge because it's peaches, right? So uh, same thing, I'd put it on the top of my table thinking, well, there's no way they're going to run across us or th- well, pass the cat onto the top of the table in the middle of the house. But the next morning, each peach had a bite in the middle of everyone, and it's like I'd just go, ah, damn you, Mars! <laughs> But it, it was like it was an ongoing thing. Well, should I? Can I tell the gross part? Of sure, it? tell the gross part. So eventually, eventually, we put poison. I know I feel ashamed, yeah. but we yeah. just said this is getting crazy. Like they're getting into everything, and it, like I said, I could hear them fighting mm-hmm. in the walls. It was sort of like a horror movie. So we put poison, and they go, well, you can tell how many you have by how fast the poison's gone. And I'm not kidding you. It's like 10 minutes later under the sink, it was like gone. Hmm. So then I I put the whole thing of poison in there, and I thought, oh, like it sounds like it's... I didn't really understand what would happen to them until it was summer, and I saw flies coming out from behind the stove. And of course, I went, Rick, Rick, come and see why are there flies behind the stove? So he actually pulled the stove out. And what had happened was he had to open up the wall. It was like Amityville Horror, because that's where the flies were coming, because they died in droves and they were like filling up the wall. Like there was just like a wall of mice. And then we realized that it was a propane stove, and I guess they can like squeeze their little bodies through those holes that like the pipes have to go through. Anyway, it was terrifying. And that's, that's, yeah. Phew! So. Those are really good ones. Yeah. But, but after all this fighting, I remember one time I went outside and there was like a compost bucket. Mm-hmm. And I opened it up and there was some water. Oh, it was empty. And I look and there was like his little eyes looking up at me. And I, you know, you think mm-hmm. I would be mad, but I didn't. I actually carried him like the pail out far away and like dumped him outside that's maybe good karma for the killing fields that you had behind the stove yeah i'm sure he came back the next day Uh, okay next we have peter gron who we managed to get in for a a quick coffee break uh, while he was busy restoring a 1988 honda xl 185 motorcycle here's peter's story every morning i have toast and tea for breakfast yeah. so I, I get up i do my usual thing the start the kettle put the toast in the toaster down and uh so this this morning i'm doing my usual routine and i push the toast down it pops up immediately right it won't stay down i'm like oh jesus and i bang down on it and yeah. toast stays down i go great problem solved continue on making my tea and then it, kind of some smoke starts coming out of the toast. And I'm like, oh, shit. And pew, flip up the thing. The toast comes flying out because I flipped up the thing. Yeah, toast really. comes flying out. And a smoldering mouse comes <laughs> bolting out after the toast, runs across the counter, and mm-hmm. disappears like smoke pouring <laughs> off his back. I mean, he was fine. It was yeah, just yeah. some singed fur. but yeah, yeah, he can shake that off. He can shake that off. But he spent a fair bit of time in the toast. So anyway, of course, toast goes into the yeah. compost. And I I don't remember if I made more toast that morning. Yeah, right. And I don't think I used the toaster again. <laughs> I'm not certain, but I don't think I used yeah, the Yeah, whether you again. used it again or whether you cleaned it out. Or, yeah, I'm pretty uh, sure I didn't do that. Did I, really, I think it was... That was the end of the toaster. That was the end of... So that was my mouse in the toaster story. Yeah. Uh, it was pretty surprising. Like, I'd never yeah. figured a mouse would be in the toaster. Be in the toaster. And, yeah. So, uh, anyway, yeah. That's that one, okay. That's now, one. I remember you said something one about the... It was... The mouse. When you had Tika, Tika the mouse, who was presumably a good mouser, oh, but yeah, I thought about this cat story. food and oh, all that. Yeah. I thought about this story. Yeah. So cats and mice. Mm-hmm. Everybody thinks that if you have a mouse problem, you get a cat. Yeah. Get a cat, and that'll solve your mouse problem. Well, yeah. I've never. I've had several cats, yeah. and I think cats create a mouse problem right. because the mice love cat food. Mm-hmm. 
they love cat food. Mm -hmm. And I usually have a feeder that the cat can go and get its food out of whenever it wants, right? Mm -hmm. And crunchy food, the little Mm -hmm. crunchies, and pretty high-end cat food. Like, it doesn't cost very much, so I might as well give them the best, right? Right. So uh, often I'll find, like, my shoes that I haven't worn in a long time will be full of cat food. Yeah. And it's because the mice are storing the cat food <laughs> in my shoes or in other places. Right. Like I'll go get something I haven't used in a long time and it's full of cat food. Now, so did, these, did you originally just think it was Tika the cat that was no, doing that? You was, knew right away. I was pretty certain. Yeah. She, they, they, yeah, she was too yeah. lazy to be yeah. stowing away cat food. <laughs> Now, all of this may sound like we're a bit sanguine about the whole thing with rodents. And, you know, maybe we've become kind of philosophical about it here on Gabriola. But, you know, I don't think we're quite as bad as, well, I remember this book when my, my, when my kids were little gomers. And uh, it was the Eyewitness series. And it was, a, it was uh, I think, Life in a Medieval Castle. You could see all the things going on inside. And uh, from the top floor of the Lord and Lady's bedroom to the dining hall uh, to all the way down to the, to the kitchen, you would see these, you know, mice and rats kind of intermingled with life underneath a bed or underneath the table while they're having a big feast, all the way down to the bottom where, you know, maybe the, the, uh, the, the castle gardener and hunter and the scullery maid's kids were all curled up by the fire and, uh, <laughs> and there would be rats and mice all kind of cuddled up to their bodies. So I guess, you know, we've always lived with, with rodents. Um, it's just the degrees of maybe separation we have kind of, uh, ha- has changed over time. And of course the fact that they, uh, They've been known to gnaw through wiring and and plumbing and and cause all kinds of disasters. And I guess the plague is in there too, right? Um, My dear neighbor Heidi is one such person who really wants to keep that separation as far as possible. Here she is. I have a phobia and and it's a genetic thing, I think, because because my mother was the same way. We, We both panic and... I remember as a three-year-old uh, visiting next-door neighbors at my grandma's, um, and there was a waste paper basket, and all of a sudden, this mouse jumped out, and I screamed, <laughs> and I've never forgotten that. And uh, the second uh, incident I remember is dear grandma. She had a funny sense of humor. Um, she, I come home from school, and she greeted me, and she said, I was in town today, and I brought your little gift back. And she handed me this little parcel in gift paper with a ribbon around, and, oh, and I was excited, and I opened it up, and guess what? In it was a dead mouse. <laughs> And I was so upset, I locked myself in the bathroom and I cried for about half an hour. I, was, I couldn't believe she would do that to me. And the third thing was my, <laughs> my sister, knowing how I mm-hmm. reacted, she had managed to get hold of a mouse trap with a mouse in it, and she showed it to me and I ran away and she followed me. And we, <laughs> she followed me with this mouse hanging out of the long tail hanging out of the trap and we cruised, I don't know, through a few streets in the neighborhood <laughs> till she finally gave up. Because you were oh, too fast. Yeah, I, I guess, I don't know, she, yeah, she's four years younger, but still. So it's my family that that really gave me a lot mm-hmm. of grief on that topic. Mm-hmm. And the worst, the worst of all, my father had a hobby, and that was chickens. Mm. He would go to exhibitions with them, and we had to, you know, wash their comb and their feet and butter them so they would be nice and yellow and all that, and he got prizes and all that. So he had a quite a, a big chicken coop, and every Saturday... In those days, we went to school till noon on Saturdays. I come home, we would have lunch... And then he would bark, change your clothes. 
And that meant I had to spend the afternoon with him cleaning out the chicken coop. Oh. Every... Ah, oh, not my fun time. So, <laughs> so this one particular day, he instructed I should bring a dustpan and a little broom with me because he had to, we were going to clean the, the coop floor. So I was on my knees sweeping and there was this huge big feed barrel and I was sweeping around it and he says, now let's do it thoroughly and he moved this barrel and I was on my knees and into my face jumped about two dozen mice of oh. all sizes oh. and all I saw was wall-to-wall -wall mice and I screamed and I managed, I don't know how, my escape route was away from these mice, was through the door but there was a two-by-four barricading and I managed from sitting position to jump over the three-foot two-by-four <laughs> without touching it and to this day, I, all I can see is mice, 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 mice. Mm -hmm. They were all under this barrel. Yeah. Not nice. Now, if you're a little squeamish like my dear neighbor Heidi, I'm sorry about this next one. Here's Peter. We indulged to excess, so I was not feeling on top of my game the next <laughs> morning. And I got up and I had to do this crappy bit of work, which was drywall in this tiny little mm -hmm. shack that we and uh, so anyway uh yeah i had to go and had like you know my breakfast was going to be a banana and some coffee which was <laughs> terrible and so i went to put on my work boots and um i got one work boot on fine and i pulled on the other work boot and right on like foot entirely into the boot mm -hmm. and i went she said that boot's not not it's not fitting very well. And I kind of took it off a little bit and I put it back on a foot entirely into the boot. And I went, there's, there's something in my boot. It's not, it's not fitting very well. And I, I, so I took the boot right off, turned upside down, mouse came out and ran across the floor. Live mouse, it was still live. And I yeah. can't believe they, yeah. are, they must be so flexible. Yeah. Because yeah. I had my foot entirely jammed yeah. in that boot. Yeah, like totally, and, it, and it wasn't like a body bending around your yeah, toes or something. It wasn't an extra large boot either. Like there wasn't a lot of extra room in there. That mouse must have been flattened down to like the yeah. thickness of a thick sock. Right? <laughs> <laughs> and, and again, survived. Now, before we get to the next set of interviews, I want to tell you a little bit about island culture here. Uh, if you're just meeting somebody, don't ask, what do you do? I mean, because that can be a hundred different answers. As well as, who are you wearing? Because eight times out of ten, you're going to get the same answer, which is gyro, which is the recycling depot here on the island where you can get fairly good secondhand clothes. But what you can ask is you can ask, hey, you got any good rodent stories? That's a good icebreaker. And also, if you see someone maybe walking out of the island home and garden and they've got a stringer of fresh new rat traps in their hands... All it takes is just a knowing nod or maybe, you know, the question like, hey, chicken coop? And the person might answer, uh, no, no, pump house. And that's all it takes. Knowing nod, tip of the hat, and off you go. And speaking of uh, stringer of rat traps, let's get to our next two interviews with Trevor Gear and Donnie Groot once again. There, there's a lot of rats around here. Yeah. yeah and Being, having chickens. Yeah, yeah. They, they like the chicken coop. There was rats. That, they they come out at night and they come and try and scavenge in, in the chicken coop what they can find, right? Mm -hmm. And so you can see them running up and down the the wires if you go out there at night with a headlamp. And uh, they're so agile, they mm -hmm. can run up a a, a stalk of blackberry. Wow. You know, they're just up and down the stalks of blackberry, and then they have nests wherever. Yeah, you know, out, out in the bushes. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. So uh, lots of rats around here. Lots of rats, yeah. When you got and uh, uh, and anecdotally, there is a um, one of the top selling items at the hardware store is rat traps. Right. Uh, the rat population has doubled in the last two years here. Hmm. Yeah. Like, they're just maybe yeah, have, suddenly having good success with more they're having success. Maybe mild winter. I don't know. Mild maybe that. Winter, maybe yeah. Hmm. I wonder. Yeah, it's interesting. Pretty resilient creatures. 
Yeah, they are. Like a f- person I know on the island who talks about you know, the sixth extinction, right? Well, the sixth extinction will be humans and a whole bunch of other animals, but I think it will be the rise of the rodents. Oh, yeah. I think the rodents will inherit the earth. Right. You know, so I think maybe they're getting ready. Maybe they're this ready. Is... <laughs> they're ready for the takeover, right? Um, yeah, maybe. And, and all reports indicate they're pretty intelligent. Yeah. Maybe, maybe they're they're communicating telepathically with each other as they prepare for this, you know, mass takeover of planet Earth. <laughs> that's right. Well, fair enough. Fair you know, enough. I, we're not doing the greatest job. Uh, yeah, yeah. That's stewardship right. here. So. That's right. Rats on the island are very um, individual, and they really are quite amazing. Now, you know, we all have stories about losing socks. If you find a rat's nest under your house, that may be where your socks are. They love socks. They roll them, they wind them together, and they weave them together, and and they line their nest, and um, then they put their babies in there, and um, they have a nice warm nest for them. So if you're looking for your socks, think about the rats in your house. But... We have another story here. I heard kind of a funny noise um, on the bedroom floor one night and uh, couldn't figure out what it was. Um, anyway, it was the middle of the night and I was tired and I was sleeping, or supposed to be sleeping, so I just kind of forgot about it. Came downstairs the next day into the studio, looked up. Oh my God, there's a hole in the ceiling. Yeah, and there it is still and for posterity's there it is. sake. Yeah, yeah, for posterity. <laughs> And there were the telltale rat droppings down below on top uh-huh. of the old chest. And um, so he got trapped up there, and then he dropped down. Now we know we have a rat in the studio. So, I mean, I know rats go into walls, and they will gnaw their way through. Right. And they will go under plastic of this moisture in the on a floor, like, you know, on ground level, down in a basement or something like that, and they'll gnaw through the plastic to get at the water that's there if they've been having that rat bait. So this one got in. So this one got in. He must have come in underneath the house yeah. and came up through the wall and then got into the ceiling. And the only way to get out was to gnaw through the ceiling. So that's what he did. And then he dropped down here and found his way around. And I must say for a few days, I didn't feel very comfortable about coming down here. Yeah, you knew because you knew he, he was, was in here he was somewhere. he was living here somewhere. He was living in here somewhere. Yeah, tucked in in yeah. a drawer or wherever. Wherever, yeah, yeah. you know, yeah. open a drawer and don't put your hands yeah. in. And and then how did you end up? How did he? How did he leave? I have no idea. Never found him. Yeah. Never found him. No. So I don't know how he got out, but he did get out. I left the door open for him. Right. I thought that was an easy exit. Yeah, maybe. Yeah. Finally, yeah. just went out the but door, you know, came in through the ceiling, and went out through the door. Out, yeah, exactly. Yeah. You know, he's not he's not a Scots um, uh, rat that has to leave from the door he came in. Now, if you don't have enough time to properly identify the uh, ancestral heritage of your rat, so what about some of our coping strategies? Maybe having an animal help out. Here's Peter, Donnie, and Heidi. I think cats create a mouse problem. Yeah. They don't really solve. They don't catch that many mice. Yeah. I had a uh, I had a list going for a while, a scorecard, I guess, with the number of mice that I caught on one column and the number of mice <laughs> that my cat caught on the yeah. other column. And I was, uh, it was embarrassing. Like yeah. if, if I was the cat, I would be embarrassed yeah. for sure because yeah. I was way ahead. The cat will sit on the floor and watch a mouse go across the floor. But as far as chasing a mouse, no. 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 And what about, um, what now you have had for years, schnauzers. Are schnauzers good mousers? They supposedly, but there are three sizes of schnauzers. Miniature and schnauzers and giants. And the miniature and the middle ones are famous for being really? mousers. Yeah. yeah. But my big ones, no. they, they play. <laughs> they, they, they play. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so then it's just doing traps. And, and Yeah, as I said, yeah. I'm, I haven't yeah. seen one yeah. in two, three years now. So yeah. knock, knock on, wood. on wood. Yeah. So it all comes down to traps and vigilance. I pretty much always got a mouse trap set. Yeah. Because you never know when they're going to come in. Yeah, and as every everybody does. Yeah. So and I mean, <clears throat> I caught so many mice that winter, I could have made a coat from the pelts. <laughs> it was, and I actually thought, you know, I should be doing something with all these dead mice and maybe making, a, I don't know, mittens or something. <laughs> like, It was a 
a continuous job to keep them under control. Where were they getting in, and then how did you get rid of them? I saw the evidence. <laughs> <laughs> the evidence. Of, of um, Moses. Anyway, and it, it, uh, it was a matter of finding the entrance, and there were two entrances, and they were all connected to little gaps in the, in the transition from the foundation wall mm -hmm. to the framing. Behind the plastic, I could see tunnels. Mm. And so we removed all that and started from scratch, and that's how I found the second entrance. And since then, I have peace of mind. No more mouses. And now, on to some other tales. And I mean other tales. What else can we be worried about here? I dropped by to see artist Karen Kane and talked with her in her studio. You've definitely got uh, some good rodent stories, but do you want to talk about those or what do you want to well, say? Well, the otters. Yes. When we first saw the otters, it was fun. It was like, oh, honey, <laughs> there's an otter in the pool. Come and see. Oh, isn't that funny? Oh, look, he's on the deck. Oh, is that another one over there? Pretty soon, there were more and more otters. Right. And one day we come home, we go up the stairs, and there is a terrible smell there. Outrageous smell. And right. the otters have set up their litter. You know, they're they're going into maternities underneath the stairs. And then we found they were underneath the decks. So we go out on the decks and the otters would be under there. And we'd be sitting there like having a cold drink in the garden. And yeah. the otters under the deck would be like growling at us. Because you're above them having we're, your cocktails. They're under our decks. <laughs> and our decks are only about two or three feet above the ground, all around the whole house. So they could go anywhere, and mm -hmm. they did, in and out, in and out. And um, it was outrageous. Mm -hmm. So I started putting up wire and heavy blocks, right. going back and forth to hardware store, getting all this stuff. And they would always find a way in. And mm -hmm. then I would be like, I noticed, like, I was like a hunter. Right. And I was... All my senses were heightened, like my hearing, my, my instinct. I was like a killer, uh -huh. really. Like, yeah. I wanted them. I didn't want to kill them. No. But I wanted them rolling around, doing all this stuff. Yeah. And the last thing that happened was my husband and I are making coffee at the espresso machine mm -hmm. in the kitchen, a glass door. And we see seven otters standing <laughs> on the porch looking in the door. <laughs> Yeah, it wasn't funny anymore. Uh, no. It was like, I'm going to get you. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know? Anyway, they took off, and uh, and apparently, so far, they haven't come back. Come back. But spring is coming, so we'll see. And when they look I'm for another ever alert. And the wiring around, how, did that actually dissuade them enough? Because I've heard where they'll tear all of that right off, oh, yeah, and they're no, back in again. Heavy-duty wiring. Yeah. And down and on the ground with a cement block. <laughs> All the way around. So I can actually walk the perimeter like yeah. I'm a prison guard, you know, yeah, walking right. and seeing if there's any digging under. Mm -hmm. So we don't know. We don't know what's going to happen, but we still have the pond. They're still going to come. Yeah. So yeah. what can I do? And and they are interesting. So, now, now, did you have in a squirrel at the same time was going on? At the same time as the stink appeared on her front, mm -hmm. underneath our front stairs. Mm -hmm. We could hear this noise, all this scrabbling around up there, you know, and we knew there was something up there. So we started taking off the fa uh, facet boards. Is that what it's called? Your fascia know? boards. Fascia yeah, boards. Lower, yeah. yeah, we started taking them off. We'd only put them up recently. Yeah. And um, the squirrel apparently had a nest there. Yeah. So he was, uh, you know, running around like she in a panic and up and down and like practically running on top of us to stop us from taking the boards down. Yeah. And meanwhile, I go into the kitchen. I'm sitting in the kitchen while this is happening with the mm -hmm. otters, the wire. It didn't all happen in one day. It mm -hmm. happened like over a whole summer. So I'm sitting there. All this is happening. And I look up, and we've got a great big china cabinet. Mm -hmm. And there's a squirrel sitting on the top of it in the kitchen. <laughs> yeah. And he's like, no problem. He's not worried, you know, at all. And we're just like looking at each other. <laughs> so I thought, okay, the squirrel, nest or no nest. So we took all the boards down, we left it overnight, we said, this is your chance, yeah. take the babies, and I yeah. think that is what happened, because we put the boards up the next day, and yeah. so we're like rodent-free, <laughs> fingers crossed. Right, and you're thinking, we built a single-family dwelling, but basically it's a condominium <laughs> for other critters. <laughs> <laughs> they, uh, uh, yeah, we're living in the forest. Yes. And so, you know, it is kind of a form of hilarious conversation. <laughs> yeah, 
Can you top that? You cheeky squirrel. Once again, here's Trevor Gear. Okay, so now I want to ask you, I think you guys have a legendary squirrel story. Something yeah. to do with the, the, yeah. right, it's the summertime. Well, this is a number of years ago. Okay. Uh, we, we, we lived in Dagnum Bay mm-hmm. on the water. Mm-hmm. Um, every June, we would uh, move a mattress out onto the deck mm-hmm. of beside our bedroom and sleep on the deck for the summer. So we had a, a little candle holder there and a box of red bird, birds that mm-hmm. might strike anywhere. And we'd light a little candle there and maybe do a bit of reading before we went to sleep. Uh, over time, we noticed that the the matches... Actually, the, the matches were in, in the... The, box. the tray right, of the right. uh, of the candle holder, one mm-hmm. of those brass candle holders, mm-hmm. and so we had a, a pile of them there, and, and we noticed that the, these matches were going missing, and we, we looked on the ground or on the side of the deck, and the, you know there wasn't any there. Um, we we just couldn't really figure out why well, it was more than one match a night that we had been using, or one match every second night, mm-hmm. and. Uh, where are these matches going? So one day we were out there on the deck and heard this skittering around. And there was this brown squirrel with about 10 matches in its mouth. <laughs> standing there l- looking at us. And off it ran. There was a, a long fir branch. And... It, it sort of it, it could leap from the railing of the deck to the mm-hmm. fir branch and run up to the tree to wherever mm-hmm. its stash spot was. Mm-hmm. And so this industrious <laughs> squirrel was stashing matches in in a fir tree in the middle of the summer. You know, so uh, as you can imagine, people get pretty fire paranoid. Oh, yeah, right. Um, gets pretty dry. And uh, these coniferous trees are known to be quite flammable. You can just imagine, right, that, you know, he's maybe up in his little nest, you know, uh, we'll call him Larry or something, Larry the squirrel. And, you know, he's, you know, itching and then the whole tree goes up. Well, that that was, you know what a match looks like. It's it's like a... A tree trunk on fire. Can you can you can imagine uh, the images going through our head of a, an entire <laughs> fir tree on fire? Yeah, not good. You not know, good. We, we had some concerns and also some questions, particularly why. <laughs> it's a perennial question: <laughs> why? Now the rumor mill runs pretty quickly here on the island, and when people found out that I was doing a story about uh, rodents, well, I even got a call from from an off islander. Who, uh, who moved away a, f- a couple of years ago, and he wanted to tell his tale. So through the magic of telephone technology, I spoke with Ben Finn. Hey, Ben, how are you? Not too bad, how are you? Uh, good, good, thanks. I hear you've got a, a, really, a really good tale to tell. I do, I do. Uh, my, my, one of my prime moments on Gabriel. Okay. And that's down Whalebone Beachway, right? Is that where you lived? Yeah, I was just like five minutes from the end of the road where you walked out of the beach. Oh, yeah, okay, okay, okay. So, yeah, let's hear the story. So, one afternoon, I was uh, I was standing on my back porch. I'd uh, just let my dog out, and uh, I was, you know, having a cigarette and, you know, enjoying the view. I mean, the, the back of my place is just, is all the, is all crown land, right? So, it's just solid forest, beautiful view. Mm-hmm. And, uh and so I'm sitting there, and uh, and a deer passes through. I had a pretty good clip too, and I was used to deer's coming through my yard, but you know, not not like you know, not flying. I mean, this deer was just bounding, and I was like, oh, that's odd. And uh, so I turn my look, and something comes through the brush, and you know, it, it's it's all long, and it's moving at quite a good pace, and I'm uh, and my dog is my dog starts freaking out, just barking like crazy, and I'm like, that's. That's unusual. I wonder what that is. So I, so I kind of lean over to get a closer look, right? Mm-hmm. And so, what are we talking about? Like a, like a otter that's in love with a deer? No, it was a cougar. Sweet Mary, mother of. <laughs> Full on. And uh, I mean, I, I, I sort of paused. All right, that's a story for a whole other show. And grab my dog's collar really fast. 
Thanks for joining us here on Straight Outta Gabriola. I'm your host, Ken Gurr. It just looked through my own. I mean, it was, and I mean, and it wasn't even in the, it wasn't even in the woods, and it was just like it was right at the edge of my yard. I could see it perfectly clearly. Now, future shows we're working on include a little trip to the garden with a special guest. We're also going to be talking to a couple of herbologists about their tips and tricks for growing the uh, the four legal cannabis plants you're allowed to grow now in Canada, and and some meditative trips to the beach. And perhaps a little journey into the forest for some bird watching. And I think what else have we got going? Oh, yeah. And we'll be doing a culture panel and a special show called Groundswell. You can imagine what that one's going to be about. The BBC would like to apologize for the following announcement. Yeah, okay, so I won't be interrupting the podcast every episode like this, but I did want to say, if you like the show and uh, and you want to keep listening to episodes, please subscribe and, and also, you know, give us a, a rating or a review on the listening app that you might be on. And, uh, you know, it just, it just helps us to know that we're not, it's not that lonely little pod set adrift on a, on a big lonely podcast sea. It'll help us feel good. Thanks for, if you could do that. And you can check us out on our website or our Facebook page, and you can just uh, Google that and find us. And thanks so much for listening. I want to thank our special guests uh, for joining us, and, uh, and we hope that you'll tune in again next time. Bye for now. <laughs>